Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Thursday live stream. So uh, we got a lot of things to cover. So let's just jump right in. First of all, you notice that my voice is a little bit different. If you were listening to the NFA live show that we did with uh, me and Ben from the Cryptoverse and a uh, guy from Coin Bureau, you will notice that, uh, of course, it's deeper. And that's just how it is. Unfortunately, right now I'm recovering from the flu. That's why I haven't been doing too many videos. So today I just wanted to jump back into it as I'm feeling a little better. And we'll see what's going on. So just like the thumbnail and the title suggests, we're going to take a look at uh, something that potentially big could be happening uh, on April 15th. Now, the Bitcoin having itself is around uh, April 20th, April 19th, depending on the, the blocks when they actually get mined. But right now, it looks like there's some positivity. And this is, uh, I think it's been covered a little bit over the last couple of days, but now we have an official date. So it looks like Hong Kong is expected to approve a spot Bitcoin ETFs in mid-April. I think this is big because, first of all, um, Hong Kong is not China. China is not Hong Kong. It's I believe they they talk about it as a uh, uh, two systems, but uh, one state. And so when we take a look at Hong Kong, it's not like China is going to immediately adopt things. So don't be uh, super impressed by this right now. But it seems like Hong Kong is like the proving ground for what China eventually does. Now, if you live in China or Hong Kong, please chime in in the comments section. But as I read, that is ex that's uh, what I get from the information that I have read. Here's what we got. So Hong Kong Securities and Futures Commission, or SFC, will likely announce the approval of the city's inaugural spot Bitcoin ETF around April 15th. The approval will enable both. And this is what I found interesting. Because sometimes when they do this, especially in different countries, especially for an ETF, they will only allow certain types of investors, accredited investors, people with high value net worth. But in here, they're going to enable both institution and retail investors to engage in Bitcoin investments via regulated ETFs. I think this is a step in the right direction. And this is just more money flowing in. And of course, as we've gone through this, we know that with the ETFs, we can just see how much Bitcoin is being taken off the exchanges and is being held by either the institutions themselves or, of course, uh, the people that uh, or the institutions that uh, they have designated. So in this situation, majority is uh, being held right now by Coinbase as customers are buying ETFs through these institutions, such as BlackRock and Fidelity and things like that. But remember, as we've gone through this, you can see just how much Bitcoin has been hoovered up. Uh, by these ETFs. So again, people, they don't want to buy spot Bitcoin ETF. They want to get into, ETF, into uh, the, the ETF regulations themselves to make things easier, maybe a little bit cheaper, maybe a little bit faster. Cheaper is debatable. But you can see that, you know, 200,000, 300,000, 400,000, 500,000, and so on and so forth. There's quite a bit of Bitcoin that's actually, uh, again, being uh, put in and being taken off the market. And there's only so much that's, uh, that's available right now. Like we're at 19 and a half million. That doesn't include the three to six or 6.5 million that's been lost along the way. So I expect a supply crunch like everybody else does at some point, but we will see. And lastly, before we move on, I thought it was interesting that in the beginning, you can see here in blue, this is Grayscale. And Grayscale, of course, had the all the Bitcoin, 619,162. And as time has gone on, iBit or BlackRock is the one that is really competing and uh, taking everything away from Grayscale as people get out of Grayscale because of their either their high amounts or people had to sell off because of they were associated with FTX or something else that was going on behind the scenes. But you can see right now that uh, for iBit, there are 266,588. And Grayscale is 315,000. So they're catching up, but at some point they'll overtake them. And then, of course, the bleeding will stop from Grayscale. But again, we'll see. These are the things we like to see. Again, I think this will be for good for price appreciation. But there was this caveat I thought it was interesting. And this was from the Van X CEO. And he states that 90% of Bitcoin ETF inflows are still retail. And I got to tell you, if that's the case, I personally don't believe it's it's 90% retail, but that's what uh, the Banax CEO does. But let's just let's just suspend disbelief for a second and think to ourselves, what if it is just retail right now? 90% of retail is is uh, is buying up uh, Bitcoin and these ETFs. What does that mean as time goes on? It means that there can only be one outcome. There's going to be a massive amount of uh, demand and not enough supply because institutions come in with even more money, and of course we got to get what those what people call the God candle.
This is what we got. This is Jan Van Eck. He was on stage at Paris Blockchain Week. Guy holding the mic right there. And he says this, he says, I was surprised, but I don't think it's traditional investors yet. I still think 90% of the flows are retail. You've had some Bitcoin whale and some other institutions move some assets in, but they were already exposed to Bitcoin, Jan Van Eck said. Van Eck said the next month, again, think of it this way. Van Eck said the next month could see the arrival of some major institutional investments from banks. I know that they've already gone through the CFTC, SEC, and asking them for the approval to actually custody Bitcoin because they got aced out by exchanges such as Coinbase. So if this is true, this could be big. Again, institutional investments from banks and additional firms, but but that the Bitcoin ETF landscape was still in its infancy. So there's a lot of maturation to happen. A lot of tech will be developed on chain. So there's a long way to go. And then he's asked why investors prefer ETF over directly buying. And he's, I think in this point, he's right. Convenience, safety, and affordability. You had 2% spreads on many centralized exchanges, platforms like Coinbase. I think we can all agree there. Unless you're using Coinbase Pro, some of those prices are a little bit wonky. We have single digit spreads for the ETFs and no fees or low fees. I think there was some that were actually suspended for up to a year. It's easier just to do a buy ticket than anything else. And before anybody says, well, that just sounds like a somebody who's who's not big into Bitcoin. Remember, Van Eck is one of the original ones to come out. And in 2017, they put a report that said that Bitcoin will not replace gold, but it will significantly complement it in people's portfolios. And back then in 2017, that was revolutionary for a big institution to come out and actually say that. So Van Eck has been huge, long gold for quite some time. And they come out and then say that in 2017. I think it was big and now coming to say this. So who's right? It's anybody's guess. But I can just say this. If we have more institutions and retail coming in in Hong Kong, and we have institutions that haven't come here full force yet, imagine what the price could be looking at May, June, July, and then going into the end of 2024, 2025. Be aware of there's some macro effects that are going on. And of course, we'll see if there's rate cuts, but it's anybody's guess. Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comments section. And then to follow up on this and what was said about Jan talked about how Bitcoin is in its infancy. There's another thing that's sh that's taking shape and it talks about this is from Franklin Templeton, one of the oldest institutions out there. They shine a spotlight on the Bitcoin ETFs and the investment firm notes that Bitcoin NFTs role in crypto innovation and market changes. This was a quite a stagnant, boring report, but it just pretty much says that things are moving in the right direction for NFTs and ordinals and things like that as far as uh, being on, on Bitcoin. And I have to agree here. I know some maximalists absolutely hate them, but uh, that is innovation. Like it or not, it's not going anywhere. And that's just what it is. So what I did partly because of this and probably because of my own curiosity, if we're looking at Bitcoin, NFTs and ordinals, I think we should all understand what's happening here. So what I did was I reached out to Magic Eden and I said, hey, I don't really understand this that well. And I'd like you guys to come on and explain things like runestone and Bitcoin ordinals and things like that. And they said, sure, well, come on. And I said, great, it's only gonna cost you one, one Bitcoin to do it. I'm just kidding, I didn't charge him. And uh, we'll be doing like an education series, like three or four videos so we can explain what that is and how it all works out. So I've got, looks like uh, Jack Lou, he'll be on 16th of April, I'll record it and I'll let everybody know. And then I've got, uh, I got Josh and Rob actually uh, next week as well. And they're from Cornucopias. They'll be on. And then I got uh, Ilya Polushkin. I think I nailed it. He'll be on the 6th of May. So uh, that'll be the calendar for Digital Asset News. So pay attention to that and we'll see how it all works out. But uh, getting back to this whole thing about innovation and things like that. I know people talk about D-PIN and such, but I think a lot of the things that are going to happen are going to be L2s built on Bitcoin. There's a great website I've been talking about, L2.watch. And imagine this. You, we hear about these ordinals and these NFTs, but we realize one big thing, which is that Bitcoin can't handle that. Let's be honest. I mean, have you seen the transaction fees when ordinals came out? It trumped Ethereum. And for Pete's sakes, Ethereum was ridiculously high. And you're going to tell me Bitcoin's going to get that higher? We need L2s. Let's just, <laughs> let's just call a spade a spade. So I see projects doing this, which are going to open up a lot of different things. And there's a lot of things coming out. But we talk about meme coins and things like that and how big they are and people like to gamble. I get it. 
So one of those I'm going to be doing a deep, there's a lot of these, look at how long. Stacks I already own. I've been owning that for like over a year and a half now. But there's one called Core. It's a layer two. And it's 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 up there. It's not like in the thousands. It's ranked 64. I think it reached the highest 49th. And what it is, it's uh using DApps secured by Bitcoin, built with a oh my god, built with an EVM, Ethereum virtual machine compatible smart contracts on a Bitcoin powered blockchain. Imagine that. So I'll do a deep dive on that and we'll see how it actually goes. I think this could be the future moving forward, but who knows? Anyhow, let me know what you think is going to be the future. And then lastly, to finish up, regulations. Uh, we talked about this, about the Uniswap with the Wells Notice being served in today's video. And it was, uh, it was, it was pretty good, me, Ben, and Jane. Excuse me, me Ben and Guy. Me Ben and Guy were talking about it, and uh, <clears throat> it bothers me. It bothers me a lot that the government can step in, specifically Gary Gensler on the SEC, and just put a Wells notice and kind of put a big wet blanket on innovation. And it's not just, and I wanted to talk about this, but I, I, I didn't. So I, I linked this video in the description. You can check it out. But I also remember that when the U.S. government steps in and, and sues anybody, just know there's going to be repercussions if you win or you don't win. Like KuCoin, uh, they came under scrutiny by the DOJ and the CFTC. The reason was because of AML, anti-money laundering, which is the same thing they got CZ Binance for. And this was just uh, April 3rd. I, no, I don't think I heard about this from anybody, but once they were, were served, that they were under investigation, their market share declined by 50%. Why is that? It's because everybody wants to take their crypto off of KuCoin, which essentially is detrimental to their entire business. So imagine you can, by doing absolutely nothing, just filling out a piece of paper and saying, here's your Wells notice, we're going to sue you, that things drop by 50%. It's not all doom and gloom, but I just thought it was interesting just how, how the effect that it actually could have. So talking about the negative... I don't want to be a Debbie Downer or a wet blanket constantly. You know, I try to try to be a little bit balanced. So let's just say this. This was a report from Bitcoin Magazine. Apparently, uh, Bitcoin friendly South Korean opposition party has won the election. That's good. From what I understand, South Korea is pretty progressive and they're actually very Bitcoin friendly moving forward. But it looks like the opposition, opposition party has won the election. They are committed to allowing domestic investors to buy Bitcoin. I said, hey, it sure would be nice if we get some crypto friendly people in office too. And that's really what it comes down to. If we get the right people at the right time and the right office, we can really supercharge what's going on. The problem is there's a massive amount of hindrances which are going on in, uh, I have to say it, the presidency, uh, the White House, uh, Congress, and three little ag agencies such as the SEC. So we have something like that, but there's things that give me hope. This was a report from Crypto Slate a couple of days ago. U.S. Senator claims Biden administration uses crypto as scapegoat to mask failures in halting illicit finance. Ooh, juicy. So this was from April 9th. I don't know what's the date today. 11th? Yeah. On April 9th, Senator Tim Scott accused the current U.S. administration of making digital assets the scapegoat in efforts to combat terrorism financing, ignoring more significant, more traditional sources of such funding. Tell me more. He argued that this narrow focus sidelines significant sources of terrorism funding, which includes Iran's $35 billion in oil exports, an additional $16 billion in U.S. hostage relief, and electricity waivers which, according to Scott, facilitate the Iranian government's misuse of funds. According to Scott, the focus on crypto misses the elephant in the room as the scope of the conversation regarding illicit finance as far larger than digital assets. Meaning, essentially, what it comes down to this is that crypto is being used as the scapegoat. You can see it with Gary Gensler. You can see it with Elizabeth Warren. You can see it with a ton of different senators and and congressmen and women, and this is just how it's going to be. So hopefully we get a little more people in, like South Korea, that is a little bit more crypto friendly. And then <clears throat> if you're wondering who Tim Scott is, this is Tim Scott, and he's on the short list 
for the VP for Donald Trump. Before anybody says, well, I thought this wasn't a political channel. It's not. I'm just telling you, that's what it is. So that'll conclude that piece. And then lastly, lastly, um, <laughs> two things. First of all, for if you're looking for the Roth IRA, which I have for the last two years, I use iTrust Capital, and you're sick of paying taxes on crypto, this might be an opportunity for you. So iTrust, just so you know, April 15th, you're able to contribute to your Roth IRA, meaning when you contribute those funds into your Roth IRA, it becomes tax exempt. You can actually trade within your Roth IRA, and that is also tax exempt. And you have until April 15th to contribute to 2023. After April 15th or April 16th, when you contribute, it goes to 2024. And there's a limit, and usually it's around $8,000 per year. So just let everybody know, as a public service announcement. And there was a video I put out. It was me and Jared Feldman, and he's from iTrust. And there's a couple of things he talked about, and there's some good lessons in there. It's under three minutes. I'm not going to play it. I'm going to have you, if you want to check it out, you can. But he says essentially this. He goes, look, he goes, we've been through the bear market. We were steady. We were measured. When everybody was asking us to add tokens like FTT and Celsius and things like that, we said no because our due diligence said we couldn't, we shouldn't do that. And they were right. I've been with them for two years now, going on three. It seems to be things are working out pretty well. And uh, the last thing we talked about was on balance versus off balance. On balance are the things that centralized exchanges do, which is why I have these rules underneath me because I like to, I don't like to waste my breath, but. Number third rule there is don't leave in exchanges. Jared said the exact same thing. He goes, we don't have on balance. Everything is off balance. Meaning if something happens to us, those are in regulated funds where they can be moved and they're not part of our income in any way, shape or form. Anyhow, watch that piece and you'll understand what I'm talking about. And then lastly, lastly, sorry, Roth IRA taxes are due. So you know what, uh, with Gary Gensler, and we talked about this today, Gary Gensler and you know him suing sin, Uniswap, he needs your money to be able to pay the lawyers to sue the decentralized exchanges and centralized exchanges and essentially get caught lying in court. And the only way to do that is to pay your taxes. That's probably the worst sales pitch you can possibly get. But uh, I just pay taxes because I don't want to go to jail. And as far as taxes in the US don't skip don't skip yes or no if you own taxes if you go through a centralized exchange they're going to know so sorry charlie but here's some good news i was watching this video i have no association with mark kohler he's an interesting gentleman and he's a lawyer and a cpa and he put out he puts out great stuff and he's a crypto enthusiast as well he put out this video called 10 crypto loopholes the rich use to get richer it's very interesting what he put in there again no affiliation i linked in the description you can check that out but one of the things that he, that he talks about using is he uses coin ledger i use coin ledger super simple you sign up there's a link in the description you get like 10 percent off you don't have to use it you can go to coinledger.io if you want to but uh that is what i'm using for uh, my taxes again this year i think it's my third year from the time that i started up put all the information in because it's already got my information like 30 minutes i just zip it over my cpa and that's it also if you're looking for, after you watch the Kohler video and you're like, hey, I'd like to find a, someone else to help me because there's some tricky stuff, click on find a crypto tax expert and there's a bunch of other people there that you can get information from. And that's it for today. So look, that concludes today for the video.